Hello, Working Preachers. This is Caroline Lewis, and I'm excited to announce that we are kicking off our fall fundraising campaign this week, starting on Wednesday, November 1st. This November, we're celebrating Working Preacher as a community of thanksgiving, encouragement, interpretation, and imagination by encouraging you to make a gift in honor or memory of a preacher or faith leader who makes a difference in your life. I'll be making my gift in honor of my cloud of witnesses who have encouraged me in my preaching over the years. I've been thinking about my parents, my professors, and my peers. Without their support, I am not sure where I would be today. Will you join me in making a gift before November 30th to celebrate the encouragement you've received from someone on your faith journey? With your support, Countless congregations will be able to hear informed, creative, and transformative sermons. You can make your gift online today at workingpreacher.org. Thank you for your support and making this ministry possible. Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Matt Skinner. And me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Caroline Lewis. This podcast is for the 23rd Sunday after Pentecost on November 5th, 2023. The first reading is Micah 3, 5 through 12, or if you are a semi-continuous reader, Joshua 3, 7 through 17, Psalm 43, 1 Thessalonians 2, 9 through 13, and the gospel text is Matthew 23, 1 through 12. Happy November. Happy Pumpkin Spice Sermon Brainwave episode. I, I, I don't know if I should tell you this, Matt, but I think they were starting to sell pumpkin spice lattes back in August. So we've been having to. Uh, yeah. I actually kind of look like a pumpkin spice. <laughs> Sorry, I never joined the new coffee generation, so I just don't keep track with these things. I do not like pumpkin spice. I like pumpkin spice as a smell, but just not in my coffee. It is amazing how popular the pumpkin spice is. But this year they came out with this apple stuff, and I like that. Oh, all right. <laughs> there you go. Well, we're avoiding Matthew 23 for good reason, because it's a really hard chapter. Uh, and, and this is the tamest part of the whole thing. Well, I was going to say that we should make a note of that because 1 through 12 is not that bad. But then the rest of chapter 23 are all the woes yes. and whoa, 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 which are conveniently skipped by the lectionary <laughs> because our next our next passage will be in chapter 25 in the parable of the talents. So, yeah, so we skip all the woes uh, and... Uh, and yeah, but so you perfectly set us, good. but we've perfectly been set up for this because last week we were talking about um, putting into practice these words. Yeah. And yeah. that's exactly so that, that this, this is tame, but it's not easy. Um, uh, the Pharisees give you the right words, but they don't live it out. Yeah, which is you know, it, it Jesus isn't just doesn't say, "Hey, I, I'm against their teachings." No, no. It's, this is a personal attack. Yes, <laughs> because he recognizes something in their character. But and I, so we probably need to say that he's painting with a really, really broad brush here. And this is noted by a lot of scholars on Matthew that to say that every single Pharisee is somehow guilty of hypocrisy is obviously an overstatement. Yes. Um, even the other gospels recognize certain Pharisees and certain scribes who uh, who are a common cause with Jesus. But for whatever reason, and there are many hypotheses, Matthew is just, <laughs> they are all rotten to the core, which is a problem if we take Pharisee to equal Jew. Correct. Right. Yes. And so just to note that, but and, um, and, so the, I think the trick is, oh, go ahead, Joy. Yeah. I, I, I want your, the trick is before I speak. Oh, the trick. I don't know if it's a trick, but the challenge, I guess, should say is how do we take this passage seriously as a criticism of religious hypocrisy without perpetuating its potential as an anti-Jewish yes. um, 
screed or, or source, right? Because I, I don't think we just say, well, let's just ignore the chapter. It's too hard because uh, this is about, at, at the core, I think, I think we can split the difference between that, make this division. What he has to say about religious hypocrisy here applies to everybody in any religious faith at any time. Absolutely. And so, yeah. Uh, so yeah, we yeah. can't, we can't weasel Absolutely. our way out of it that way. So I knew that you were going to get there and I'm just going to uh, highlight it. And that is um, we need to be careful when we allow the media to define for us evangelical broad brush and then equate that with Christianity um, as a, a equal, equal uh, you know, as a, as a total equality. And so for folks who need to understand why it is important not to um, make this uh, equality between the Pharisee um, who are hypocritical, descri hypocritically described here uh, as um, Jew or uh, need to understand how we are guilty of this and why you would say it is true for every um, religious group and ev in every time is because we do the same thing. And uh, that might be how we define progressive or liberal or conservative or evangelical or th our own little teasing we do between Presbyterians, Lutherans, and, and Methodists. Um, broad brush uh, gets us in trouble. Uh, and I'll end by saying it's important to recognize that um, when E. Stanley Jones spoke with Gandhi, Gandhi said he didn't have a problem with the teachings of Jesus. His problem was that those who claimed to be Jesus's followers did not live out those teachings. Thank you, Gandhi, for sounding like Jesus. <laughs> hmm. Yeah. No, I think that's a that's a it's a critical caution with this passage and um and you know commentaries will point that out and it's something that we uh, but again when we situate this within the context of matthew and and we've said this now and i'll keep saying it for the next couple of weeks now that we're coming to the end of matthew this is not this is not anything new i mean this <laughs> this is what Ma this is what jesus has been talking about and and preaching about since the very beginning of of his ministry and the uh, the the continuation or the correlation between what you say and what you do and what you teach and and preach and 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 how that gets embodied and so it's and the and I think the other thing that is this is what's at stake here is that if that's not if that's not happening with a leader or an authority in a in a community how dangerous that is or not, maybe not dangerous but how how that has to be uh, has to be named i mean and so there's there's a lot at stake with regard to how we are called to live like that i mean as Christians, as followers of Christ, but as leaders, as authorities, whether that's you know whether that's uh, seminary professors or or parish leaders or whatever, uh, that uh, that 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 is that's significant, um, and and so I think that's part of what's happening here too for for Jesus, <laughs> that you know that as being called to represent God or to uh, to be authorities in terms of interpreters of Scripture and you know embodying God's commandments in the world uh, calls for calls for that correlation and so I th that's that's a kind of a subterranean element of this passage for me as well. So it's it is against the leaders. I mean it is. It's in a call. Uh, it's an address to the leaders, but um, significantly so because that's <laughs> people are watching you, yeah. <laughs> and they're watching you because you asked to be watched, yeah. or you they're watching you because you're in the position to be watched. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Pay attention to that, yeah. and well, I that is it's... no small thing. No. 
This is a text that's, I think, obviously much easier to explain than it is to preach. The, mm -hmm. um, from the one hand, the preacher feels like, oh my goodness, if people only knew what a horrible person I am, uh, you know, they'd realize that Jesus is talking about me here. You know, I mean, it, 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 it's hard to repeat this without feeling like you're sending the message, well, I'm not, I'm not guilty of hypocrisy ever. Um, so that's a difficulty. The other hard part is just where is the good news in this? And for that, I would maybe help people see, maybe you have to go to other parts of Matthew as well to talk about where are the places where Jesus is worried about religious abuses, uh, hurting other people. So chapter 18, just before the parable of the lost sheep, you know, he takes a child and says, basically, woe to whoever would put a stumbling block in front of one of mm -hmm. these little ones. Mm -hmm. And then he says, it'd be better if somebody put a millstone around your neck and threw you into the sea. So, I mean, it's also That's a hard text. Amazing. But the, the refrain, I think, throughout Matthew, and we'll see some hard passages coming up in Matthew 25 in a couple of weeks, that uh, the problem with religious laziness or religious presumption or arrogance or hypocrisy or just inaction is that it finally hurts mm -hmm. suffering people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if there's good news there, it's that the, the suffering people are where Jesus has promised to place himself. And so maybe the, the last verse in this helps us with that, right? Yes. Those who humble themselves will be exalted. That if there's good news, it's that Jesus will always side with the ones who are the on the short end of the social equation of power imbalances or just um, abusive religion, whatever religion we're talking about. At least that's where I would go to try to help people see where, where is God helping us in the midst of this. Well, and it, yeah, it's a call to, I mean, 11 and 12, I think that's really helpful. Like how how is it that you can read the passage backwards in a way? that this is coming from, this is, this is not again, like an attack against, you know, uh, well, kind of is, but, you know, but, uh, but it, it is, it's coming from a vision of the kingdom of heaven where the greatest among you will be your servant and all who exalt themselves will be humbled and all who humble themselves will be exalted. It's, it's a, it's a vision of the kingdom of heaven that, that really does call for a different kind of way of going about leadership and, and, and and one's role in a community, and so uh, that that reading it backward and having that perspective too, and then that overall, like you said, Matt, like going back through Matthew and where have we, where before in Matthew have we seen verse twelve being stated as that's what the kingdom of heaven is looking is to look like and. Uh, and that's the vision to which Jesus is calling us and, 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 and everybody, <laughs> you know, and nobody is exempt from that. You might be the person in power, the person who has authority, but you don't, you don't get to be exempt from working that vision out. Yeah. Well, Matt, you said this a couple of weeks also, where you talked about Moses and him being referenced as a prophet because um, while he was a lawgiver, he also uh, stood in the gap between God and the people and spoke to God on behalf of the people. Um, it, it, even as he had uh, a special favor with God, he reminded God again and again uh, that these were, were God's people. Uh, and uh, in many ways, that's the leader's role is to serve the people. That, Caroline, is what the, king, the kingdom looks like. When those who have been set apart, and when I say those, I mean individually and collectively, because that was what Israel was, the collective community set apart for the sake of all the world. And so this uh, idea of serving being what it means to be uh, fully in the kingdom of God is, um, well, it's it's sort of like tending a garden, if I use that image. Um, and uh, by I, I'm, I'm horrible with gardens. I kill every living plant that comes in my, <laughs> my radius. Uh, but the, the, the metaphor of the garden is this idea of um, they were to till the earth and it would be fruitful. 
that everyone would have, every living creature would have sufficient to eat. That's service. Um, and it was only after the fall that that service became difficult. I, I like the mica pairing. I do too. Week because it's an illustration of just how much damage a false prophet can do. Yep. Yep. And I also like the fact that we're rerunning a commentary from Carolyn Sharp because she, I think, writes really well and yes. makes me wish I was a, a prophet's expert like she is. Yes. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. I would call people's attention to uh, the commentary. Carolyn it does a, a great a, a great job with that. Uh, and, you know, getting us into getting us into Micah, you know, Micah. And, and I, I think it's uh, it's it's a great pairing as well. Because I think, you know, when people think of Micah, of course, think, oh, and you've you've done this before, Matt, Micah. Oh, that is such a great verse. Right. <laughs> yeah. It's only six, eight, right? You know, <laughs> when it's a whole book, right? Yes. And, uh, and, and, but you're, but that, that pairing of, that's what I was trying to get at with uh, earlier with my comment about what's at stake here is, is yes, the kingdom of heaven, but, but the, the persons who say they are, uh, that the persons who put themselves or are in the roles of tending that as to use your language, Joy, uh, what happens when that's not tended well? Uh, and the false prophets who lead people astray, or the, or the, or, or the rulers, or the the authorities uh, who do not practice what they preach, or do not practice what they teach, and and just it, I think homiletically, just to sit there with people for a little bit. What happens when people do not practice what they preach? What happens when they do not embody? Um, you know these these commandments from the Lord, these the the righteousness of God, you know, the hunger and thirst for righteousness. Bad things happen, and uh, and and so it, it's a it's a space to not just not just say, well, practice what you preach as a kind of platitude or a moral lesson. It really is the opportunity to sit and say with to sit and say what what indeed happens when that's absent and uh and yeah that's the two yeah. things two things come to mind uh both are tied back to things that that ha have been said before um uh a week back when we read first psalm first psalm psalm one for Psalms, when we read Psalm one, uh, and and I referenced that that tree standing, uh, and then the wicked not being able to stand in the congregation of the righteous, um, that's what is des described here um, at the pointing against uh, the house of Jacob and the house of Israel. Uh, this is a recognition that the very people of God, those who are set apart to be righteous, are the ones who abhor justice, are the ones who pervert all equity. And, and, and so I think one of the things that we need to remember, as hard as this text is, it becomes even harder when we remind our listeners that this text was not given to the Canaanites. It was not given to the Gentiles. This word was given to the people of God who had failed to practice what the covenant had called them to practice. Um, so th that, that's, that's one of the things that st sticks out for me. And the other is something we often lift up, and that is, what does this say about God? And uh, again, this mic of text is difficult because what it says is, the moment's going to come when you're not going to hear from God if you keep this up. Mm-hmm. Mm and the commentary gets into what it means to not have a vision of what God is planning, what God is intending. Yeah. Two more moves. Yeah. Or you have a vision that's not. Oh, that's, <laughs> you put forth that God is, you know, God is clearly calling me to this or. Uh, and, mm. and it's not unrecognizable in terms of what actually the tenets of God are in the character of God would be the character of God. And so that, that, that 
vision that you have does not at all align with <laughs> God's vision. So that's another point of uh, dissonance, if you will. Mm-hmm. That, um, yeah. Well, and Carolyn Sharp's commentary is so cutting because she has those those four lines you might hear like at a congregational meeting, which are all pretty tame. But yeah. she's saying <laughs> even these things have a, a tinge of false prophecy to them. But so um, Joshua. Yeah. Joshua, Joshua won at succession. Anybody All who right. watched that show, Joshua gets the company in the end and leads the people into the promised land. We could talk a lot about the book of Joshua as a whole, mm-hmm. but maybe we better just stick to the <laughs> the reading here. Yeah, and I would point uh, I would point our listeners to Brian Whitfield's oh, commentary. Gosh. He, he does a great, a really wonderful job with this and. Um, particularly his discussion of of rituals mm-hmm. and yes. the meaning of rituals and and in the in the life you know in in our communal life as um, as believers and so uh, yeah shout out to Brian yes. one of my yeah. classmates from Emory uh, back in the day and I really appreciated uh, really appreciated his reflections on the meaning of ritual and why it's, why it's important to us. So, yeah. Ah, I, I agree. And I miss giving some shout outs to some of my friends that have written before, <laughs> but I, I agree. I really like what he does here with this ritual because this is um, uh, for this generation that is under the leadership of Joshua, um, which themselves will become a transitional generation, uh, a generation that includes those who have and many who have not seen the great things that the Lord has done. And so they're going to see for themselves the kinds of things that were great. And those who have seen it before will see a reminder, and that is the the walking through the Red Sea on dry ground, crossing the Jordan on dry ground. Um, the presence of God uh, in the tabernacle, uh, the tre- presence of God, uh, uh, the presence of God in the tent, um, the presence of God that had uh, walked with them through the wilderness. And um, this also is just that continuation of the close of Deuteronomy where Moses dies and we're told that Joshua will, will rise up. And so the Lord makes the same kind of word with with Joshua that has been made with Moses. I will be with you. The people will see that uh, I'm I'm um, holding you up, um, and uh, as Moses was a leader, so Joshua will be. And fast forward to the end, which is why I made this reference to the people, is that so long as the people see the acts of God. They trust God. But when God is silent, and that's why I'm doing this, to go back to the Micah verse, when God is silent or absent, the people's behavior only gets more wicked and more violent and less a following the way of God. So in some ways, I've spoken about another portion of the larger portion of Joshua, but um, this Entry into Joshua is important for us to know that the presence of God among a leader is possible, uh, and and Joshua will be that next leader behind Moses. Yeah, uh, yeah, I really appreciate that joy. And going back to the commentary where how Brian ends uh, ends the commentary with regard ritual is not is not just for the sake of ritual. Ritual points we do we do these rituals to remind us of the presence of god and the promise of the presence of god and so rituals hold behind them and in that and that act or in that symbol uh the promise of the presence of god and and how particularly we need to be reminded of that promise uh, in in a kind of embodied way, um, and that we're acting acting that out. And as he notes, also particularly in times of transition, mm-hmm. where you you know is God is God still with us or not? Is God following us? Um, is God following us into this transition? And so, it's I think the 
I think it's really some, it's really fascinating what, when you think about like, you know, the transition of crossing the Jordan, how that then, how that, that, that act is also symbolic of the transition of leadership mm -hmm. and, you know, of, of Moses to Joshua. And so, yeah, I think, um, it might spit it might speak specifically to a number of congregations who are experiencing transition or you know individuals with that with that promise so i yeah be I'm gonna, really direction to go mm -hmm. with this message. i'm going to attribute this uh line to renita weems i think i read it in one of her books uh somebody can correct me if uh they um know a different source but uh the question is what are you doing while you are waiting for God to make God's next big move. Mm. What are you doing while you're waiting on God to make God's next big move? And in some ways, one of the things that we do while we're waiting is th practice those rituals so that we're reminded of what it looks like when God shows up. Yeah, yeah. I will bet the two of you can't guess what I would do with Psalm 43. <laughs> Can we make three guesses and the first two don't count? Sure. Uh, Psalm 43. Let's see. I'm going to guess you're going to use it liturgically. No. No? Oh, no. no. Yeah, I told you you wouldn't be able to guess. Okay. You got me. <laughs> yeah. I really think about That's Psalm three. <laughs> Here's my idea about Psalm 43. I'm going to give the idea, but I'm also going to say, I have no idea how I would pull it off, but I would okay. probably try and okay. fail okay. spectacularly. Okay. I would have this in a sermon on either Matthew 23 or Micah 3 or both of those. I would have this be the voice of somebody who has suffered as a result of other people's false prophecy or religious hypocrisy. Nice. Because okay. it's somebody who's yeah, who goes directly to God with the complaint. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and says, "Why are you cast down on my soul? Hope in God, I will again praise God." Yeah. In other words, it's like, you know, it's the line from Isaiah that Matt, that Jesus recites in Matthew, right about a, a I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quote it wrong, right? A bruised reed he will not break, and a, a, a flickering wick he will not quench. It's this idea of you hypocrisy will do its damage. You better believe it. Mm. But there's something about the resilience of faith and God's commitment to those who have even been abused by leaders that might still be. So, I, you know what I mean? I would use this as kind of a counter voice. Mm -hmm. This is what the people we hurt say to God about us, kind of a dialogue. Does that make sense? Yeah. I would have never guessed that. I'm not smart. Well, that's why I had my, my pithy little dare, but, um, no, that's yeah. that's the best I can do with it. This I should yeah. have, I should have gotten that. Because <laughs> what it's not I a competition, thinking, Joy. Come on. I know, but what I was <laughs> thinking, what I was thinking was, um, what I what I noted as we were looking at this is um, the thematic repetition of songs. So the Psalms are also the, the poetry or the, the hymns, right? And these words, as you've already noted, coming from Isaiah, quoted by Jesus, uh, these words are the repetition of people who have been wounded uh, by uh, um, oppressive or uh, unjust leadership. And they come out in different ways. And my thought was, you can hear this if you recognize it in rap music, in hip hop, you can hear it in breakup songs. You can hear it in country. Um, and, and so I should have caught that because that was the, the this might be how to do it. Um, Taylor Swift is going to use it in her next breakup song. <laughs> there you are. We're, we're yeah. going to look for this theological statement. <laughs> as long as I get one penny for every download, I'm okay with that. Oh, oh yes. yes. There you go. <laughs> right. Uh, Thessalonians, our third reading. So we're still in chapter two. Again, still at this um, recognition of who and where the people are. And I, I think um, um, we didn't do that so smoothly, but that is a great uh, transition from um, um, 
match use of the Psalms uh, as this uh, a voice of people who have, and now I'm going to use the Thessalonians language, who have labored and toiled, who have worked hard, um, um, who um, under different leadership have been burdened. Um, and um, we're getting an opposite description uh, here as, as Paul is speaking of Timothy and Silas and his leadership here. I think one thing that that is um, another direction that one I don't know maybe maybe one could take but I think one of the interesting things about this letter and uh, when we get it in Romans is that as well where Jesus or Jesus Paul same difference where Paul uses uh the phrase while we proclaim to you the gospel of God and uh not to get too f- far into uh, you know the use of the objective genitive or subjective genitive or whatever uh but that we we tend to equate the gospel of Jesus Christ right the gospel of Jesus Christ or the gospel of Jesus and the fact that Paul uses that phrase the gospel of God I uh, is I think really, uh, significant, particularly here in this letter of of that of the, God has been about gospel. God has been about gospel way before Jesus came along. Way before Jesus. And so that this that and how is it that the work of the Thessalonians is is caught up in that gospeling of God? I think is one of the one of the beautiful things about the reminders here that Paul is communicating to the Thessalonians is that they are part of this of this thing that God does, which is good news. And um, and they have worked toward that and they have been a part of that. And for that, Paul is deeply grateful. <laughs>